today we're going to be looking at, at Galatians, and I'm so glad that we're able to do that. And I want to start by asking you a deep and profound and meaningful philosophical question. And it's this. What makes a gorilla a gorilla? You see, the story goes that the gorilla at the local zoo died, and the keeper was distraught. But the trouble is, bank holiday weekend was coming. And so the management called him in and he said, they said, now look, we cannot have a zoo without a gorilla. So what we want you to do is to go down to the local theatrical costumiers, find yourself, <laughs> find yourself a gorilla costume, and at least for Bank Holiday Monday, you are going to be the gorilla. Well, reluctantly, he did say... He went and got his costume, went, uh, dressed up in it, went to the, the enclosure, and, you know, because he'd, he'd known the gorilla for so long and knew him pretty well, he got pretty good at swinging from branch to branch, and uh, nobody knew the difference. Until he took one swing too many, and his hands slipped, and he went up into the air and described a stately arc and landed with a thud in the next enclosure. Now, in the next enclosure was the lion. <laughs> and in his desperation, the keeper in the gorilla's costume went to the side of the enclosure, started climbing out, and as he felt the heavy weight of the lion's paw land on his back, he screamed, get me out of here! <laughs> At which point, the lion spoke. <laughs> and it said to him, Shut up, or else we'll both lose our jobs. <laughs> what makes a gorilla a gorilla? Are you a gorilla by virtue of the way you appear, the things you dress, the rules you obey, or are you a gorilla by being born a gorilla? Well, rhetorical question. Let me change that question very slightly, and you'll instantly see the reason why we're asking it. What makes a Christian a Christian? Are you a Christian by virtue of the way you appear, by obeying a set of rules, or are you a Christian because you are born one, born again by the Spirit of God? My friends, that is the main message of Galatians. We are Christians because we've been born again by the Spirit of God. We have been given freedom in Christ, and the rules that at one time bound us no longer do so. You and I are Christians not because we have obeyed a set of rules or because we've been through a set of ceremonies, but because we have been born again by the Spirit of God. And we, we need to remember when we look at Galatians that this is actually a letter. And a letter is one of the most revealing forms of literature. We, we, we reveal our hearts in letters much more than we would in a lecture or a sermon like, like this. But a letter is only one half of the conversation. And therefore, as we go through Galatians, not only do we need to read what's on the lines, we quite often find ourselves needing to read what's between the lines. And as that little film um, hinted earlier on, we find Paul in Galatians, Paul is the, St. Paul is the author of Galatians, we find him frustrated. And we're forced to ask, Why? Now, actually, as we lead, read through the letter, we find some of the most famous Christian one-liners, things that I tend to carry around with me as I, as I walk with Christ. We get some of those faith-building verses that, uh, that we can have floating around in the back of our minds, things like Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ, and yet I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. Or another one in chapter 3, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, uh, neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ. Or in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I've got them written down in front of me. <laughs> or, or Galatians 6, carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will, fulfill, you will fulfill the law of Christ. There are a lot of famous Christian one-liners, verses that, are, that, that support my faith, that you'll find in Galatians. So can I encourage you, my friends, to, to read it? Read the whole book. I say the whole book. It's only about four pages. It's not exactly long. 
Um, read the whole letter. And as you read it, let me just uh, suggest one or two things to look out for. As you read, the Galatians, read through Galatians, look out for some of Paul's metaphors, pieces of picture language that are intended to, to evoke uh, a, a deeper truth. He talks, for example, in chapter 5 about a yoke, not, not an egg yoke, but a yoke that yokes oxen together while they're pulling the plow. He talks about an athletics track and running the race. Uh, he also talks about a stumbling block. This is, this is my stumbling block. <laughs> I slipped on it on the stairs, went tumbling over, and then landed up in Gloucester Royal Hospital. They were fantastic, I have to say. But um, no, that's why I'm sitting down. I'm in a bit of pain this morning. But the pain I'm feeling is nothing, nothing, compared with what Jesus went through for me. And my friends, honestly, that's what keeps me going. He talks about stumbling blocks. Not only does he talk about meta he use metaphors, he also uses rhetorical questions. Now, rhetorical questions are questions that we ask in order to make a point rather than to get an answer, yeah? So he says, for, for example, tell me one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Well, because they know the answer to that. Or elsewhere, he says, guys, what happened to all your joy? Or, or in Galatians 4, um, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Questions he asks in order to evoke a response rather than just to, to get an answer. So have a look out for those as you read through Galatians. And I say, it's only four pages, I encourage you to do it later on today, perhaps, before you forget. Let's now ask a, a what-if question. What if Paul had not written this letter? I put it to you that it is likely we probably wouldn't be here today without the book of Galatians. This letter has been significant right throughout Christian history. Humanly speaking, if this letter had not been written and Paul had let these Jewish teachers get away with their, their modifications to the gospel the Christian faith would probably have become an obscure Jewish sect and little more, and you and I will probably never have come to Christ. Let me take you back to the Reformation in the, the 1500s. Remember that before then we were all Catholics. But the Catholic Church in the 16th century had become corrupt. Now, I know I'm painting broad brush here. We're, we're not, one thing we're not is anti-Catholic, but this is the situation in the 16th century. You could, for example, pay money to the church in order to be guaranteed your position in heaven. And the church had a monopoly on truth. They would say, if we say it, then you have to believe it. End of story. And some theologians started to protest about this. That's why we're all called Protestants. Yeah? And two of the leading lights in this, this Reformation were these two men, Martin Luther and John Calvin. And they came up with, with some famous phrases, one of which was this. In Latin, it's sola fide, sola scriptura. In other words, by faith alone and through the scriptures alone. And in arguing the case, they used the book of Galatians as one of their most prominent and powerful books. It was, a, it was one of the main uh, weapons in the reformers' arsenal. In fact, Martin Luther loved this book and... Um, he even called it his, his Catherine von Bora. Now, Catherine von Bora was his wife. And he said, the Galatians is my Catherine von Bora, for I am wedded to it. He wrote a commentary on Galatians, which is still in print, by the way. So, without this book, many of the great truths of the Christian faith, the things that we now rely on, would not have been able, uh, w would not have come into the frame. So let's start just by having a look at Paul's opening gambit as he starts this letter. And it's significant what Paul said in his opening, even in the opening few words. Now, if I was writing a letter in Greek style to you, it would begin, Ian, to the people at St. Andrews. And that's the way Paul begins. Paul to the churches in Galatia. But he expands it and he says this, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me. So I'm not alone in this. It's not just me writing. All the other uh, Christians are telling you the same. 
to the churches in Galatia. So even in his opening gambit, he's starting to weave in the core values of his message. Verse 3, Grace and peace to you, he says, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. He's, he's weaving into his introduction the idea that God's grace is there for us. God's ridiculous, undeserved benefit to ordinary people like you and me. And that we have peace with God. God is no longer my enemy because of the sacrifice of Christ. He talks about the generosity of God. God gave himself. And he talks about the rescue that God's given us. That uh, you know, this world is against God. This world's values are passing and destructive. But God has a plan for our life and he has rescued us from our baser selves. It's also significant what Paul did not say. If we look at his other letters in the New Testament, at the beginning of almost every letter, he compliments the church he's writing to. To Corinthians, he says, I always thank God for you. To the Romans, he says, I thank God for you because your faith is being talked about right throughout the world. And in Philippians, he says, I thank God every time I remember you. But in Galatians, zilch. <laughs> Not a bean. Now, why should that be? Let me just introduce you, if you haven't already met him, to this trendy fella. Um, <laughs> Robertus Meldenius. Robertus Meldenius is attributed, uh, has this phrase or this sentence attributed to him. Which things should we make a fuss about? This is something he wrestled with. And he said that in our faith, in essentials, unity... In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In other words, if, if we were to talk to each other about our faith in this room this morning, almost every one of us would have some, some slight difference with somebody else. But which things really matter? That was what, what Maldenius was wrestling with. And what Paul does in Galatians is he highlights the fact that these things about what the gospel actually is really matter. And what we've learned in Christian history since is if we try to accrete things, add extra stuff to the gospel, we run into all sorts of trouble. So in essential things, there needs to be unity. In non-essential things, we can, we can afford to be nice to each other and, be, and accept one another even though we think very differently. There's nothing wrong with that. But in all of this, we need to demonstrate Christian love. And I find that a really helpful principle. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And this is where Paul starts. Because he recognises that his assertion of the gospel does not come into the non-essential category. It is essential to our life in Christ. That's where he places it, right from the very first sentence. And his very first sentence con uh, contains quite a strong Greek word. I am flabbergasted, he said, or I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He's gobsmacked. He can't believe that having taught them the gospel, they're now going in some other direction. It's not really a gospel at all, he says. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. That word pervert means to twist or to warp. It's, a, it's rather like looking at yourself in a, in a fairground, wind, uh, fairground mirror. You know, you pay your money and you go into the hall of mirrors and what you see is you, but distorted in all sorts of different directions. In the right colours, recognisably you, but a ludicrous imitation of the real thing. That's what Paul is saying here. These Judaizers, the people who want you to go back to Judaism, are doing to the gospel. If you saw that shape in a flat mirror in the morning, you'd be seriously worried. <laughs> Some of us more than others, probably. <laughs> But Paul takes this one step further. He says, actually, it's so fundamental that this different gospel is not really a gospel at all. It's not good news, it's very bad news. Particularly if you're a bloke and need to be circumcised. 
makes the eyes water. That's enough detail, I think. (laughs) So instead of receiving my salvation, my state of being right with God as a free gift, I have to earn it by doing something. And by obeying thousands, literally thousands, of obscure pharisaical rules. So what is the gospel that Paul wants them to believe? That Paul taught them to begin with, and now they are diverting. I'm actually going to use some words from Romans, but these are consistent with what he says in Galatians. Here's what Paul says. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, and bear in mind that was the biggest divide of Paul's day. We could add there is no difference between rich or poor, clever or struggling, man or woman, old or young. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who called upon him. For everyone, says Paul, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's it. Paul's gospel is astonishingly simple and uncompromisingly inclusive. Of course, over the passage of time, we've done our best to be, you know, to, to clarify this and, and, and to make its meaning clear so we can understand it. That's why we have the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed and so on. But Christianity's good news at its heart is a simple coming to faith in Christ. It's living with him as my Lord and my master, or my my mentor, if you like, as best we can. And my friend, if that's you this morning, then you're in. You've been saved by Christ. You've been adopted into God's family. And if not, what, what better day to start than today? Give it a try. Say, okay, God, for this next month, I'll live... I'll live with Jesus as my mentor. I'll read a bit about him and try and model his life. And I'm going to call on you to to help me along with that. That's one way of getting into being a Christian. Try it out. You see, in verse 11, Paul says this. "Um, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach to you is not of human origin. I didn't receive it from any man nor was I taught it, but rather I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And for me personally, this is one reason why I am a Christian and remain one. Because Christianity has not been invented by a guru or a religious mystic, however famous. It's not been imposed on me by some religious organization like a church. God has done something in me and for me that I couldn't do myself and given me an assurance that he is with me and has rescued me from my baser self and that by living like Jesus as best I can and I fluff it up like we all do but by living like Jesus as best we can his company is assured with me even when life is its lowest and its toughest. My friend, if you trust Christ this morning, your relationship with him is secure. Can I encourage you not to worry about the rules and regulations, but to give yourself consistently and wholeheartedly to him so that your life will be a mirror image of Jesus himself. God bless you.